Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Finding Me in the ITV Networks. With me today is the dynamic Diana, Dr. Diana Bhutu. And Dr. Diana Bhutu is a Palestinian activist first and foremost. Secondly, she is a human rights lawyer and Diana is also a fellow at the Harvard University. But I think the focus today is to raise the questions and to bring about a discussion that will touch to the heart of many South Africans to talk about issues that are usually not spoken about or to ask those questions that are hidden in the mind of many who are too polite perhaps to ask those questions and so I've invited Dr. Diana here today to challenge her with these particular questions although welcome and and thank you for being here Dr. Diana. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam and thank you for having me. And I think that although I'm going to ask these questions at the end of the day I probably and the viewers will be left more challenged Inshallah. by what you have to say. Let's Let's go to the very beginning and the beginning for me is this targeted propaganda script that you find, you know, it sounds almost like a stuck record every time you switch on the mainstream media and there's a discussion on the Palestinian issue. Um, you hear that it is Israel that is defending itself, that Israel is responding, that Israel is under attack, and it is never that the Palestinians are protecting themselves against oppression, against occupation, against war crimes, the fact that the Palestinians have been dehumanized. So I want to take these sound bites one by one, and I would like you to then just evaluate or perhaps break them down. The first, of course, is the, it's, it's the typical sound bite that you will hear always, is that Hamas wants all Israelis dead. So Hamas, it, the, the interviews that you hear, it speaks about the Hamas Charter, that speaks of the elimination of Israelis, etc. How do you respond to that? Yeah. I, I think this is always the farce and the ruse that the Israelis are trying to present. And, uh, you know, as the expression goes, when you point a finger at somebody, you're actually pointing for it yourself. Um, and this is precisely the case when it, when it comes to Israel. If you look at Israel's charter, nowhere in Israel's charter does it talk about the Palestinians who were ethnically cleansed from their homes or even the Palestinians who remained as citizens. Instead, it defines itself as a Jewish state, and which means that it, by its very definition, discriminates against anybody who's not Jewish in that country. And they, what they desperately seek is they want to have an exclusively Jewish country. This is why they have so many discriminatory laws. But to get to the specific issue about Hamas's charter, every single Israeli political party that is currently in power also has a similar charter to that of Hamas's charter, which ex calls for the exclusive Jewish Zionist state. Uh, the the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, political platform specifically does not call for a Palestinian state. The major political parties also don't call for a Palestinian state, and none of them, not a single one of them, recognize the Palestinians who have been ethnically cleansed from their homes. None of them call for equality within the nation itself. And each and every one of the political parties that is currently in this government believes in the expansionist policies of building and expanding more Israeli settlements. Okay, but why you, whilst you're saying that, you, you're speaking about ethnically cleansed Palestinians, but the process is not, it's not past tense. It hasn't stopped. It's still on going. Okay, but, but more specifically in terms of the media, that the focus is that the Palestinians are the terrorists, the Palestinians are the evil ones, the Palestinians want all Jews and Israelis dead. However, there is an alternative narrative that's not usually discussed, and it came out very clearly now in the Russell Tribunal, when David Sheen, the journalist inside of Israel, uh, showed those different slides of different Israelis right across the spectrum, speaking about wanting a genocide of the Palestinians, wanting the genocide in Gaza, wanting the expulsion of the Palestinians. So in terms of Palestinian propaganda, what are you guys doing to try and get out this alternate narrative to show that, excuse me, for every one that you speak about Hamas, there's like 500 that's coming from inside Israel? Look, I think the issue is not about individuals, it's about the political parties and the political parties that, that because they're the representatives. And so going to that level, uh, you can even just look at Moshe Phelan, who was deputy speaker of the parliament in, in Israel, who called for a genocide, and, or for the various members of the parliament who've, call, who've labeled Palestinians as snakes. Yeah. Their history in terms of seeking genocide and actually carrying out uh, methods of ethnic cleansing are, have not only have a past, but they have a present, yeah. and unfortunately they have a future as well. In terms of countering all of that, we face an uphill battle. 
And I'm being very honest in saying that we face an uphill battle. If you look at the media in the United States, in Canada, in, in most of uh, Western Europe, that media is very much adopting the Israeli narrative. And it's ironic for me um, because of the fact that if you think about the history of South Africa, and I was somebody who was raised during a period when apartheid was still in place. I was living in Canada, though. I never once saw on Canadian television uh, somebody who was a supporter of, of the ANC having to be on the same platform as somebody who specifically was pushing for apartheid policies. We didn't have that level of balance. In fact, nobody would have said, oh, we need balance. Oh, we need to hear both sides. Sides. But when it comes to Palestine, the Israeli narrative has seeped in so deeply that they've made it seem that Israel's just a normal country and that we simply have to have balance. They don't recognize that with the balance that they're, that they're actually promoting is allowing spokespeople to defend and to promote ethnic cleansing. It's allowing spokespeople to push for uh, the wholesale expulsion of Palestinians from their homeland. And they're, they're, it's allowing these, these Israeli spokespeople to push for war crimes and yet the, the journalists simply don't confront the, uh, the Israelis on this. Okay, but at the same time, they, there's another part to this, and the, when, when you hear the narrative, it's that Israel has a biblical claim uh, to the land, so the Palestinians are actually intruding on something that happens to belong to the Israelis. And recently I found out that through international law, there is no such validity to... to to this kind of a claim. In, in international law, there is no biblical claim or past claims, terra nullis, I think it's called. So why aren't you then perhaps countering, instead of re responding to their rhetoric, you know, just ignore their responses altogether and present these facts to the public? Because I see so often in interviews where the Palestinian activists have to, are forced to respond to or defend what the Israeli sound bites are giving out all the time. And so your message never comes across because now you're always countering this. But there's another part, that part that people should know that there is no such thing as a biblical claim. There's no such thing in international law as having ownership to the land, etc. Isn't there time, a, a need to revisit how you put forward perhaps your, your propaganda, if I may say so? Uh, it's, uh, I think it, we're, we're um, talking about some Thing where we're not at that level yet. And the reason I'm saying this is because the Israelis and the Zionists have spent more than six decades mm. working with the media and pushing the media and trying to get these sound bites out. And we are always on the receiving end. What I mean by that is we don't have the luxury of being able to decide when Israel is, uh, is going to attack. In fact, we, we wish it never did. <laughs> uh, but and so these media machines that they have that accompany their, uh, their attacks are always well planned out in advance. And so we are, by our very nature, always on the response, responding end. That being said, that being said, I think we're doing uh, a a good job, maybe not the best job, at being able to address and get people to understand what's happening in Palestine. My job is not just to respond to Israeli claims. That's what I'm sure the journalists would want it to be. But I think that judging by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people who came out uh, during the attack on Gaza in support of Palestine, it's clear to me that the message is getting out that people don't believe the Israeli lies any longer. And they may be able to convince a person who isn't very, um, who isn't very well acquainted with this situation and never will be very acquainted. But those aren't the people who are part of the, the change that I'm seeking. I'm seeking the people who are intelligent, who want to do something proactive, and who are looking to actually do something uh, for Palestine, who are looking to, to change the narrative, to looking to really uncover what's happening. And think of the, the bottom line is at the end of the day to try and reach the person who just has inherent human dignity and goodness in them because you can see when something is wrong, you just know it's, it's wrong. You know, Quraysh, I want to uh, address that particular point. When During the attack on Gaza, um, one of the main and one of the most disheartening points was when I was constantly having to defend our right to be alive. Right? And with, with journalists, after journalists saying that uh, we had a culture of martyrdom or saying that uh, we were being used as human shields, that we wanted to die, etc. You know, and for each interview, I called them out and I told them exactly that this was racist, that this was not the type of thinking, but it was beyond racist. It was that they themselves didn't have a measure of humanity. Yes. If you are asking somebody, uh, isn't it within your culture that you want to die, then it means to me that you yourself don't have a measure of humanity. Yeah.
Uh, whilst you're talking about that, I was thinking of Rafib Ziada uh, when she, she narrated that poem and she says, uh, so we, sir, we teach Palestinians how to love, you know, so it was also responding to that because it says you have these suicide bombs, you have these human shields, the Palestinian mothers send their children out to die, etc. But we have one minute before we go to the break and let's just do the second soundbite. Israel cannot negotiate a peace settlement because the Palestinian leadership is divided. Israel wants peace, Palestine doesn't. Oh, what well, yeah, a farce. <laughs> First and foremost, it's the Israelis who have divided Palestinians. But we'll leave that aside for the moment because you're running on time. But the main issue is that when we were divided, the Israelis refused to negotiate. And now that the Palestinian Authority has come together with Hamas, the Israelis are also saying, oh, we can't negotiate because Hamas is in the government. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that you can't have peace because the Palestinians are divided, and then when they unite, say, oh, we can't have peace because they're, they're united. They're united. At the end of the day, Israel is looking for excuses for not ending its occupation, for not giving Palestinians their freedom, rather than reasons for giving Palestinians their freedom. Okay, so we have to go to a break. When we come back, I have more questions. We'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me and the ITV Networks today with Dr. Diana Butu. And before we went into the break, we were speaking about the sound bites that are very often featured in the media and how to counter that. And, and Dr. Diana, you, you spoke about this where the Palestinians and the Israelis, um, the, the quagmire that usually is that Palestinians don't want peace, Israelis want peace, etc. But I, I think. We've, we've kind of covered the sound bites you mentioned about Hamas and, and the suicide bombers and the, the human shields. And then, of course, there's the other issue of the, the tunnels, that the tunnels are dug basically so that the Palestinians or the Gazans can attack Israel. But no mention is ever made of the fact that these are the people who are besieged. The, the, Gaz, the, the tunnels are a lifeline for them. So the one part of the narrative is presented and not the other yes. part. Look, a part of it is that, uh, I have to be quite honest, during this latest attack on Gaza, you were left with just a few people who were willing to go out and speak about Palestine. The Palestinian Authority largely went underground and didn't say very much. Right. That being said, the tunnels. The tunnels are, are a lifeline to Gaza, but not only a lifeline. If Israel has the right to bomb Gaza, then we have a right to seek protection and go underground. Yes. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. If Israel has a right to drop bombs on our head, then we have a right to also protect ourselves. And what the, is, what the Israelis are always trying to do is they're trying to portray it as though there's this you know, suicide operation that's constantly taking place. But what they're failing to address is the fact that these tunnels were built and, excuse me, dug because of the fact that this blockade has been in place mm -hmm. for seven years, a blockade in which they were counting the calories of what Palestinians were, were consuming, mm -hmm. in which uh, basic supplu food supplies were not allowed into Gaza, and in which um, the, the quality of life was practically down to zero. If you think of your own life, your life is not measured by what food you eat. Mm -hmm. It's not measured by, uh, by little things like that. It's measured by, do you have the ability to see your friends and family? Do you have the ability to go abroad? Do you have the ability to meet your friends who, who may not be in the same small area that you live in? And what Israel has done is it's denied Palestinians that very basic little thing. So it's not surprising that they did tunnels. Not at all. Okay, now, considering what you just said and that the fact that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, went underground, um, my question is this, that if the PLO is committed to Palestinian freedom, why does it cooperate with the Israel and security issues as, as it recently did in the prelude to the occupation protective edge? And of course, that was the, the, the start where the, uh, Hamas was blamed for the three settlers and everybody knew that it was not Hamas. And, and the PLO cooperated. And, and in a large way, this cooperation, in my opinion, prevents conflict resolution. Absolutely. It extends the occupation. Absolutely. Look, the main problem today with the PLO is that it's lost its compass. Oh. 
it's no longer uh, it has the li the word liberation in the title and that's it and uh, the Palestinian Authority similarly the big problem is that the the PLO the Palestinian Authority are now in effect serving as the sub security co subcontractors to the Israelis uh, they do this because this is the only way that international money will flow this is the only way that international support will flow but it's fundamentally misguided there's no place on earth where the occupied have to provide security to the occupier yeah. and yet they've turned us into people who as the occupied have to provide security to the occupier the tragedy is not just that security cooperation continues the tragedy is that Mahmoud Abbas the current leader of the Palestinian Authority has come out and said that security cooperation is sacred that's where the tragedy lies when you see that this process of negotiations has failed it's gone nowhere in 21 years when you see that security cooperation has failed it's only sent more Palestinians to prison rather than liberated them one would expect that a leader would say enough I'm not doing this any longer I'm going to switch gears I'm going to push for BDS I'm going to push for a popular popular struggle uh, but instead this leader continues to not only push for negotiations but continues to engage in security cooperation even after the attack on Gaza. So considering what you've said in, from what I have read and from what you have said, it's obvious that the PLO has developed patronage networks. It's, it, it has enriched, and so there's a certain elite within the PLO and the Palestinians who continue to, to serve the occupier, um, irrespective of the protracted conflict and the harm that it will bring to the ordinary Palestinians. So, if you're looking at it from both sides, it's obvious that Israel has mastered the colonial plan, divide and rule, yes. between Palestinians themselves and between Palestinian and uh, between Palestinians and Hamas. But I've heard many times Palestinians say that the PLO is not going to the ICC, for example, because if they do, then the US and the EU, etc., and Israel will withdraw the tax transfers, the funding. Now from an Islamic point of view. You and I, and, and I'm sure many of the Palestinian leaders read the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu yabsudu risk li yasha. And then considering that that is the criteria, the fundamental thing that we believe in, why do you think that the Palestinian leadership, the PLO, is so dependent on this risk from the occupier, which is continuing the zulm on the Palestinian people and the occupation of the Palestinian people, and not making that tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or saying, let's go against the grain, you know what? It doesn't matter. We might be impoverished, but then we still have that room in Allah. You know, I say this over and over again. Uh, you will not find a more resilient people than the Palestinians. You won't find a more creative people than the Palestinians. You won't find a stronger, more courageous people than the Palestinians. Yes. That leadership doesn't reflect the courage, the resilience, or the strength of the Palestinian people. That's unfortunate. It's the, you know, the resilience you can see in people who are crossing checkpoints every day. The fact that uh, the, the creativity, people, when the Israelis were cutting off fuel from Gaza for, for cars, they turned to vegetable oil yeah. to, to be able to uh, use their cars. And the courage I don't need to talk about. The problem with this leadership is that this leadership doesn't tap into that resilience, it doesn't tap into that courage, it doesn't tap into that creativity. And instead, it's relying upon the international powers. These same international powers who've made it very clear that they, will ne that they never want to see Palestine free. They make statements that they want to see Palestine free, but they never put sanctions on Israel for, uh, for any of the actions that Israel is doing. And in particular, this last action of uh, the war crimes that were committed. You don't need, we don't need to go to the International Criminal Court for, pe for the world to know that what was being happening was war crimes. We don't need to go to the International Criminal Court uh, in order to hold Israel accountable. We, can, we have other means as well, uh, whether it's sanctions or boycott or other things. But the tragedy is that this leadership rather than uh, using those other means as well, has also failed us by not going to the international So then is court. there a difference in, the, in the, the Palestinian people per se between those who are in Gaza and those who are in the West Bank and East Jerusalem? Because the people in Gaza have now stood firmly behind Hamas. And every time, if you look at this concept of tawakkul and the understanding of risk and that it comes from Allah, every time the Hamas has been degraded or run to the ground, it is inna al-izzata lillah, that Allah has brought the izza back up and they have been elevated but we never see the same in terms of the PLO. But the PLO is representative of West Bank and East Jerusalem. So is there a disconnect between the Palestinians in West Bank and East Jerusalem compared to
to the Palestinians in Gaza? No, we are all one. I think that, and I, I want to challenge you a little bit and say, um, nobody can claim to be representative any longer. Right. And the reason I say that is we haven't had elections. Uh, and that's not the only way you get credibility. I, I recognize that. But we have not had elections since 2005 for the president and 2006 for the parliament. So nobody can claim to represent me. Nobody can claim to represent the Palestinian people any longer. The Palestinian people across the board, West Bank, Gaza, uh, in the north, in 48, you name it, East Jerusalem, they're all the same. Strong, resilient, proud, and courageous. And it's this leadership on any of those political parties that is failing to represent us, even Hamas, for what happened uh, during this, this last attack on, on Gaza. Well, what they did was they stood up to the Israelis, they showed Palestinian courage, they were strong, etc. I still don't see a strategy for liberation that yeah. is coming from them. And this is what I want to see. I want to see a political party that has a strategy for liberation. Considering that we are now at this dead end where there is no strategy for liberation, but at the same time the tools that are available in terms of the international world and international society, they themselves are already so laced with poison that it's hard to believe that you're going to find a liberation strategy coming from there. Let me explain. You're a human rights lawyer, but human rights are relative, and we know that we see that in most cases human rights firstly are Eurocentric. They, they privilege the, the white Christian male, mm -hmm. and there is a hierarchy to the value of human lives of which the Palestinians are at the bottom rung of the ladder. You're not the right color, you're not the right religion, you're in the wrong place. And of course, um, they're protecting uh, the white Europeans, which are the Israelis. In what way then are the Palestinians, what tool can they use to try and find this liberation? Because the international community and the international world is not going to bring about that liberation. I agree. As a, as a human rights activist, and lawyer, uh, it's, a, it's a very small tool, yes. right? And uh, because it's a, sm a very small tool, I don't inflate it. I don't think, think that we're going to get liberation by going to court. I, I don't believe that. That said, I don't think this world just consists of white males and white uh, European males. And um, I think that the world is obviously much more diverse. And this is why, for me, the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions movement is so key. It is so key because just as boycott, divestment, sanctions work to liberate South Africa, again, white European. Um, it, I'm surprised people even, you know, thought of, of liberating South Africa if you look in those, in those contexts. Um, just as it worked for South Africa, it will work. Not that it can work, it will work for Palestine. And what I mean by that is we don't have to be beholden to whether Sweden is going to recognize Palestine or the UK government is going to recognize Palestine or wh whichever country is going to recognize Palestine. For me, it's not about recognition of Palestine. It's about punishing Israel, holding Israel accountable, making Israel feel that it's paying a price for its ethnic cleansing, for its occupation, for its crime, criminal actions, making Israelis feel the same. Mm -hmm. And through that, I feel that we will get liberation. Okay, so we have to leave it at that and I have to say thank you very much for being here and for sharing these viewpoints with us, although I had very many more questions for you. But we'll see you next time. Fiyamanila. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.